But I'd have to say that I'm impressed that so many people uh, wanted to come in and listen to my talk rather than doing something boring like sitting at the beach or so feel very gratified. The title of my talk has changed a, a couple of times, but you know, this is sort of the at this point I decided I'm not going to change it. And I think this title summarizes the kind of things that I'm going to want to discuss to talk about LHC physics and to also talk about what we've learned from the Tevatron and how that can be applied to the LHC. I'm going to be doing this using the language of uh, the current American political administration, which I understand is very popular here. And for those people who are Americans, happy for the So it's not supposed to be a topical talk, a pedagogical talk, but uh, let me just say that the, the Tevatron and both experiments, CDF and D0, are running well. Uh, if you've, as you've already seen during this uh, uh, summer school, there are results that have over one inverse femtobarns that have been presented at the winter conferences. And we're just finishing now a shutdown and starting to take more data. So we had this experience with the Tevatron, but the question is, everybody's looking forward to the LHC. And the question is, what to expect of the LHC? Okay, well, if you talk to a theorist, they're going to show a plot that looks like this. You know, this is sort of the expectation. And if you look, there's lots of you know, interesting sounding words like uh, quintessence and uh, looks like thamelon, and so and there's a lot of things that just are not yet thought of. Yet. But that's kind of dreamy-eyed you know, for experimentalists. We need something more concrete. So we need more concrete language. And there's no one who has more concrete language than our current Secretary of Defense. So using his language, we can categorize you know, what we're going to expect at the LHC as the known knowns the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. <laughs> okay, the question is, what are those? Well, the known knowns, the thing that we really know well is the standard model of the Tevatron, right? Because we have an inverse femtobar and a data under a belt. So we know what the signatures of W's and Z's and gamma's and leptons and jets and missing ET are. And we can apply that knowledge to project to the LHC. Okay, what about the known unknowns? Well, I'll put in that category the standard model of the LHC. You know, and you can say, well, well, we know the standard model already from the Tevatron, but we're applying it in a new kinematic region, you know, small x, for example, and there might be a, a few surprises. And of course, I can't tell you what the unknown unknowns are, because if I knew them, they wouldn't be unknown anymore. And that's the best thing about the LHC, is that there's almost guaranteed to be unknown unknowns. There's things that are going to surprise us, and that's what makes this an interesting time for the field. All right, so there's an LHC bandwagon, you know, everybody's jumping on the bandwagon, including me for this talk. And as I said, there's a lot of useful experience from the Tevatron, but also from the HERA. That, uh, you know, so that there is uh, workshops at HERA LHC and Tevfer LHC, just trying to say that our experience is important for LHC physics. In addition, I'm almost finished with a review article for uh, Reports on Progress in Physics with John Campbell and James Sterling that's titled Hard Interactions of Quarks and Muons, a Primer for LHC Physics. So a lot of what I'm going to show you know, during the course of this hour is going to be from the review article. And towards the end, I'll show you where you can get a, a copy of the almost finished version. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to point out some rules of thumb for the LHC. You know, things that you can say, okay, this is what I expect. But I also wanted to dispel some myths. One of the things that I thought was crucial is that if you look at an expansion of a cross-section, you know, say W plus one jet, you have these terms that go as, you know, one plus alpha sub s times alpha sub s squared. And I think too often people concentrate on the powers of alpha sub s. And don't concentrate enough on these logarithms, which in some cases can be large, even larger than the factors of alpha sub s, and can dominate the, the kinematics for a particular cross-section. So we're all looking for beyond the standard model of physics at the LHC, right? No one has come up to me and said, you know, I'm joining an LHC experiment because I want to do only standard model physics, right? We want something new, something that explains the questions that we heard in the lecture this morning. But before, it's easy to find, to discover beyond the standard model of physics, but the trick is to discover beyond the standard model of physics that's really there. What we've seen with uh, UA1 and UA2, you know, that you can discover standard model beyond the standard model of physics and might not really be present. So in order to have any confidence, you have to first discover the standard model at the LHC. Measure the standard model cross-sections, 
make sure that your detector, your algorithms are, are uh, operating properly, and that you understand the standard model physics present at the LHC, the known unknowns, correctly, before appealing to any beyond the standard model explanation for anything in any anomaly that you observe. So the experiments Atlas and CMS you know, are going to have a program during the early years of the LHC to rediscover the standard model. I mean, right now we don't have many data, so we just have a Monte Carlo where it's easy to rediscover the standard model because that's what we put in. So as I said, the uh, experience at the Tevatron is very useful, but scattering at the LHC is not necessarily just rescaled scattering at the Tevatron. For example, there are small typical momentum fractions for the PDFs and many of the key searches. So this means that there's going to be a dominance of gluon and C-quark scattering instead of valence quark scattering, as at the Tevatron. There's going to be intensive QCD background, or if I wanted to summarize this as the punchline of a joke, I would say there's lots of standard model that we have to wade through to find beyond the standard model pony. And if you haven't heard that joke, I'll be happy to go over it in recitation. All right, so what is the early running of the LHC going to look like? So here's my assumptions. You know, I've been told I'm too pessimistic, but you know, on the other hand, every time I'm too pessimistic, when the data actually comes around, I've been told that I've been woefully optimistic. So we're gonna turn out in 2007, in November, with a, a smattering of data, but not at 14 TeV, but 900 GeV. So this means no discovery, right? You know, because this is ground that's already well trained. In fact, there's only gonna be a few Ws that we observe. But on the other hand, any data for the detector is going to be precious to try to understand how well it's operating. And then in 2008, we turn on at 14 TeV. We get our first serious data, but we don't know all of our algorithms. You know, you know, for example, the jet energy scale is probably only going to be known to the order of 5% or so. You need data to be able to improve that. And, but on the other hand, you can have some easy discoveries, such as a low mass Z prime, or perhaps a low scale SUSY. In 2009 and 2010, we started getting more and more data. This gets us into discovery areas. And plus the more data that we have allows us a finer calibration of things like our jet energy scale. And that's when we're coming up with discoveries by the Wazoo, and that's when we're making our reservation in Stockholm. But it's during this early period, sort of 2007, 2008, maybe part of 2009, then we have to put all of our standard model cross-sections in order. So here's from the uh, Manji and Audi lectures, and it shows you what kind of performance we might expect on day one. As far as the uh, electromagnetic calorimeter uniformity, you know, it's of the order, and the scale is going to be known of the order of a few percent. But of course, there's lots of data we can use to improve that, even minimum bias data, but Z goes to EE. It's going to be very crucial, right? Because there's a lots of Z's decaying to electrons. We know exactly what the mass is, and so that's going to be very good for calibrating the entire electromagnetic calorimeter. Hydronic energy scale and the jet scale are going to be known more poorly, but again, there's going to be lots of data that we can use. In fact, if you look at the kind of samples that we're going to have, say for 10 inverse functor bars, we're talking about millions or tens of millions of events. And there's a lot you can do with that kind of statistics. Okay, so whenever I ran spell checker on my talk, you know, it claims that there is a uh, misspelling in the title. But I know that I've heard our American president use this on multiple occasions, so I'm going to stick with this as my title and say that we do have a strategy. You know, the goal number one, as I've said, is to understand and calibrate the detector and the trigger using in situ well known physics samples. And then goal number two is prepare the road for discovery by measuring more complex cross-sections, more complex final states, such as TT bar, WZ plus jets. And then once we have all of those lined up, then we can start looking for new physics. So what are the, let's start with a very basic thing at the LHC, the total inelastic cross-section. So that's something very straightforward. You'd think it would be known, but actually there's a great deal of uncertainty. You know, when we're extrapolating from the Tevatron up to the LHC, we don't know whether the cross-section is going to go as log s or log squared of s. So you can see at the LIC energies, there's a great deal of uncertainty. There's also an uncertainty of what the charge particle multiplicity is going to look like in a typical event, what the average PT is going to be. But again, this is one of the measurements, one of the first measurements that can be made. 
you know, once we turn on a 14 TeV. Look at the charge particle multiplicity, a little bit more complex, you know, to measure the total elastic cross-section, but that should be something accessible in the first year. All right, now we talk about the underlying event, and a lot of people think this is boring. And most proton-proton collisions or proton-antiproton collisions are kind of boring. They're peripheral collisions, you know, and they produce, you know, sort of a fairly low number of particles with low transverse momentum in the final states. We call these minimum bias events. So here's an example right here. So these are all from Rick Field, by the way. So I think one of his biggest contributions to the field is all these cartoons that he's provided us for our, our talks. So more interesting are the collisions where there is a hard interaction from one proton, a hard, a hard interaction between a parton from one proton and a parton from the second proton, and I have a hard collision that's taking place, producing, for example, two jets in the final state. But of course, that's not the whole thing that's happening. On the top of this hard collision, parton parton, the rest of the partons are already also colliding. Some of them are just going to have this very soft kind of peripheral type of collision, but it's also possible to have multiple parton scattering that produces semi-hard scatters, you know, say of a few GeV. And it's actually going to be possible for these semi-hard multiple parton interactions to produce jets in their own right, you know, especially at the LHC where they're going to play a more important role. And these can serve as an additional background to the physics signals that we're going to be looking for. All right, so here's the measurement of the underlying event at the Tevatron. So here we have the region in phi, so we have two pi. So we have the jet direction, the lead jet direction defined by this arrow. So we define two regions transverse to the direction of the lead jet. One of them, on an event by event basis, has more energy than the other, so that we call transmax. The one that has less, we're left with calling transmin. And then we look to see what the energy depositions in the transmax and in the transmin look like as a function of the lead jet PT. So again, remember that if I have a jet here, then, to, then uh, most of the time I'm going to have another jet that's roughly pi or 180 degrees away. But on the other hand, I could have multi-jet events, and so I could have a jet in one of these transverse regions. So we see something very interesting. If we look at the transmin region, then we can see that going from you know, close to zero all the way out to the end of our range, 450 GV at the Tevatron, that we have basically a flat distribution. It doesn't matter what the PT of the lead jet is, the amount of energy in the transmin region is flat and consistent with that observed in minimum bias events. But if I look at the transmax region, I can see that the amount of energy in that region is growing as the PT of the lead jet. So for example, if I have a third or fourth jet in the event, I'm going to deposit the energy primarily in the transmax region. So that's getting the higher order contributions, but it seems like there's no higher order contributions going in to the other uh, trans, uh, transverse region. And also a nice thing <coughs> to observe is that, you know, here's some Monte Carlo tunes, and you can tune Monte Carlos in order to be able to describe the data well, both in the transmit region and the transmax max region. And that means that you can, in any analysis that you can do, you can try to mimic the kind of background, the kind of difficulties that the underlying event is going to create for your analysis. Okay, we're going to have to deal with the same thing at the LHC. So here I have a couple of predictions. So the black is data at the Tevatron. And these three curves here are projections to the LHC for charge particle multiplicity and for the uh, average PT in the transverse region. And one of the things that you can see is that it's going to be a lot larger at the LHC than at the Tevatron. And not only that, we don't know exactly how much larger it's going to be because different models give different predictions. And again, as I say, this is going to be a background, especially with the higher level you know, some of this underlying event is going to create jets. Some of it is going to create, you know, you know, add energy to existing jets. Some of it is going to spoil the isolation for objects like photons or leptons. So we're going to have to be able to deal with this at the LHC, not only in the interaction of interest, but also when we're running at high luminosity at the additional minimum bias interactions that are taking place in every crossing. 
So in addition to this underlying event, you know, so the soft scatters, semi-hard scatters that take place, there also can be gluon emissions from the initial and the final state. And again, several of our speakers have already talked about that during the course of the school, because this is the kind of thing that's included in uh, higher multiplicity tree level calculations or next to the order calculations, as well as in parton shower Monte Carlos. So you can run a parton shower Monte Carlo and it you know, provides you with the kind of event generation that you need, but it's also interesting to have a rule of thumb that you can get by looking at pseudocoff form factors. So Peter's already talked about pseudocoff form factors, given a nice derivation for the form that these have for the initial state. So you can see it depends on the splitting function, ratio of PDFs. If this is a final state pseudocoff, the PDF weighting wouldn't be present. And basically, it gives you the probability for a parton not to radiate when evolving from a large scale down to a, a small scale, <coughs> not to radiate within a particular resolution. And so here's a very nice paper by Stefan Giesecke, that's uh, one of Peter's collaborators on Herwig, in which he's calculated these Sudikoff form factors. So here, for example, is the Sudikoff form factor for a scale of 500 GeV, so a hardness of 500 GeV in the event. This is the probability to go from 500 GeV you know, down to 400, 300, 200, 100, and 0 without radiating a gluon of 10 GeV PT or larger. And as you can see, as I go further and further down to smaller and smaller cutoff scales, that probability for not radiating is going to be smaller, or the probability of radiating at least one gluon is going to be larger. Does that make sense? So you can go through, you know, and all of these Sudikoff form factors, and you find that the probability to emit a gluon is going to increase with the color charge. So you're going to have a larger probability of emission for a gluon than for a quark. So that's sort of obvious. It's going to increase with a larger max scale. The higher the virtuality, the hardness of the collision, the higher the probability of an emission to take place. But it's also going to increase with a smaller value of x. So what, this is you know, some curves that are taken from the review paper. These are the Sudikoff form factors. The top is for a quark goes to quark blue for three different values of x, for 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.03. And the bottom is for a blue one splitting into blue blue. And here I have, again, for now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, six values of x. You can see the further that I go in x, the smaller the Sudikoff so the larger the probability for a gluon to be emitted. So if I take this particular point here, this corresponds to a gluon with an x value of 0 0.01. This is the probability not to emit a gluon greater than 20 GeV. And then if I read off the scale, then I can find that that probability to not emit a gluon is of the order of 70%, i.e. the probab probability to emit a gluon is of the order of 30%. So if you're doing an analysis at the Terratron or the LHC, and you want to say, OK, what is the probability that I'm going to have initial state radiation from one side, you know, then you can just read it off from the Sudikoff form factor curves. So the question is, why did I show the Sudikoff form factors for six x values for the gluon splitting, but not for the quark splitting? And the reason is, I should have given it as a homework assignment, but the reason is, except for that all the Monte Carlo people that I've asked this question didn't know the answer, so it would be a hard homework assignment. The reason is that the blue goes to blue blue splitting function has singularities both as z goes to zero and as z goes to one, whereas the quark goes to quark blue has only a z goes to one singularity. And so as a result, and if I put the lower x curves, they would basically lie on top of the blue curve, whereas with the blue goes to blue blue, the lower an x I go, I still have this you know, decreasing Sudikoff form factor. Now, if I go to small x or high scale or a gluon, then the probability of an initial state gluon emission approaches unity. And the above sentence basically describes the LHC. Small x, lots of gluons. So I'm going to have lots of gluon radiation. So for example, if I look at TT bar events and lepton plus jet final states, I have lots of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 jet events where the extra jets 
from being created by radiation, both from the initial state and from the final state. And that's the kind of environment we're going to have to operate in at the LHC. All right, let me turn next to the next to leading order. Again, Laura is going to talk about this in more detail after the break. I just want to say a few things about it. Uh, one of the things is that perturbative calculations have a realistic normalization and sometimes a realistic shape only at next to leading order. And I think that as experimentalists, we don't make as much use of next to leading order calculations as we should. Because in most cases, they're not tied into a Monte Carlo, right? It's just putting out partons, and we have to interpret those partons. But again, if we want to go to next to leading order, and the process hasn't been included in MC and NLO, then we're forced to work with these parton level calculations. <coughs> and they can tell us things about our experimental analysis, such as acceptances, you know, templates, etc. One of the things, though, we have to be able, willing to either correct the data to the parton level in order for these comparisons to be made, or we have to correct the theory to the hadron level in order to correct the data. So there's a lot of calculations that are available. Basically, all of the two goes to two hard scattering cross sections have been calculated, and some two goes to three scattering processes. So the state of the art is sort of W or Z plus two jets. And people are trying to extend this, you know, and maybe Laura will talk about this, to sub W or Z plus three jets, and that should happen perhaps in the next three years, but it's not going to be immediate. It's a very difficult problem. So there are places that have collections, you know, of uh, next to leading order codes, such as the CEDAR website that's shown here. And my favorite, you know, is MCFM, you know, just because it's very convenient to be able to generate events and store them in terms of root end tunnels. So here's just one example from the Tevatron where a leading order analysis was performed with the assumption that it would be the same at next to leading order, and that turned out not to be the case. So here we have WBB bar and W plus two jets. And so if you look at leading order, or with the leading order of you know, Parton Shower Monte Carlo, you would say that the HT distribution, you know, the sum of the transverse energies of everything in the event, the HT distributions would have the same shape. And so, okay, then if I want to, for example, you know, estimate what the WBB bar fraction was, then I can just take my W plus two jets and multiply it you know, by some you know, scaling factor and say that's my WBB bar. But the trouble is that next to leading order, they don't have the same shape. So that assumption was incorrect. And it turns out to be a dangerous variable to use HT for this kind of effect. And if you use a more inclusive variable, like the PT of the lead jet in the event, then that turned out to be a lot safer as far as leading order to next to leading order differences. And here is just, again, from the review paper, something that I found was useful for myself, hopefully it will be useful for other people, is just a list of all of the K factors for different processes, you know, at the Tevatron and at the LHC. Again, a lot of times there's a shape, but sometimes you just want to know one single number What's the ratio of the total cross-sections? And here you can see that you have to be careful. What scale are you defining the k-factor at? You know, what PDFs are you using to calculate the next to the leading order cross-section, the leading order cross-sections? But again, there's a number of iterations that are all shown here. All right, now we come to jet algorithms, my favorite topic. <laughs> so you have this hard interaction you have a parton coming out, but you're not observing the parton in your detector, you're uh, observing a jet. So you have a parton coming out, it's creating lots of uh, gluons being radiated off. The gluons eventually evolve down to some scale, and they produce some resonances, like A1s and A2s. And then all those resonances decay into pions and kaons and a few protons. Those enter your detector, and that's what you're measuring. So you have a bunch of energy deposition in your calorimeter, spread out over a number of cells. And based on those energy depositions, you're trying to work back to what happened at the original hadron level, all the particles that are in the jets, and in some cases, what happened on the original parton level, what happened in the original next or even more calculation. Now, as Nigel talked about, there's two types of algorithms that can be used. One is the KT algorithm, 
that basically looks to see how close you know, particles or calorimeter towers or partons, how close they are in momentum space. And the second is the cone algorithm, which looks how close they are in coordinate space. Now again, if you have a jet algorithm, you'd like to be able to apply the algorithm at all three levels. You know, you have to be able to apply it to the detector level, but you'd also like to be able to apply it at the particle level. For example, at the output for a Monte Carlo, and you'd also like to be able to apply it at the parton level. Either parton level from the parton shower in Monte Carlo, or the two partons that you have in a jet at the next donating order level. Now, as Nigel said, for some events, the jet structure is very clear. So, you know, this isn't exactly the same uh, event that he showed, but it's something similar. You know, and if you asked anybody to point out the two jets at the event, then, I mean, your mind is very good at doing this kind of jet reconstruction. You say, well, here's one jet, here's the second jet. And it doesn't really matter whether I use a KT algorithm or a cone algorithm, you know, those are the jets. But on the other hand, you can have an event like this, where this is a real event. And here you can see that, you know, this interaction has been very busy. Lots of hard blue on Bremsstrom taking place. And what I include in one jet or another jet is going to depend very much on the type of algorithm. So for example, if we use a particular cone algorithm jet clue, we get one result. If we use another one, the midpoint, we get a second result. And you can see that in this case, it's 40, 423 compared to 408. If we use the KT algorithm with different parameters, we're also going to get different results, especially regarding <coughs> whether, for example, these two guys should be split into two jets or they should be one jet in the same case over here. So this is where the subtleties of the jet algorithms have to be understood, especially when comparing you know, detector results to parton level results. So the algorithm that was adopted for run two at the Tevatron is called the midpoint algorithm. And again, this is something Nigel has already talked about. It's a cone algorithm, typically using a radius of 0.7 and 8 of pi space. Uh, it uses the variables transverse momentum, rapidity, and phi. It applies a C threshold. So if you're trying to look to see where the jet begins, you know, then you're not going to look any place unless there happens to be one GeV in a parton and a particle on a calorimeter tower there except at the midpoint between two jet cones. There you're always going to put a seed. And the reason for that is to try to reduce the infrared sensitivity of the algorithm. And that's how it got its name, is the midpoint algorithm. OK, so we have the jet algorithm that's specified. We have the energy deposition in the calorimeter. But we know that the energy in the calorimeter is not the true energy of the jet because of everything that happens whenever these particles go through the calorimeter. So we have to correct for the calorimeter response. And so it's going to be different response for electromagnetic energy, hydronic energy. But we know how a jet fragments, and we know how our calorimeter responds to each of those particles, so we can construct a response function. And that's shown here. And so and we can also correct for resolution effects. And so we can apply this and then get back to the jet energy that was deposited by the original particles that were incident on the calorimeter. And that's a level for a jet we call the hadron level. If we want to go back to the parton level, there are two additional effects that we have to correct for. We have to correct for the underlying event, the fact that this additional collisions that are taking place that have nothing to do with the hard scatter that produces the jet. That's going to put energy in the cone, so we have to subtract that out. So that's given by this red curve here. But on the other <coughs> hand, we have to add some energy back in, because remember when I had the jet, I said that the, all the gluons in the parton shower were going to eventually produce resonances, such as A1s. Those A1s were going to decay to pions. Well, you can have an A1 that's pointed inside the cone, producing three pions in its decay, and one of them is going to be kicked outside the cone. So, you know, next to the leading order calculation knows nothing about that, nothing about that kind of fragmentation. So you have to correct the jet for that effect, and that's given by this curve here. So a nice thing is that these two curves are in opposite direction, but the 
underlying event subtraction is a bit larger. <coughs> so that wins out. So you have net subtraction for a cone of 0.7. But the really interesting thing is that for a cone of 0.4, the two effects cancel out to within a few percent. And so if somebody is doing a hadron level measurement, you know, at the Tevatron, for something like this, and with a cone of 0.4, unwittingly they're also doing a parton level measurement as well. All right, so Nigel's already showed this. So this plot here, it's interesting because you know, all the publications insist that you have to have you know, this plot shown. But there's no information in it. It's just kind of a gee whiz plot. Boy, it really falls over orders of magnitude. But the real information comes from a plot like this, showing data over theory. So a linear plot shows that you can do precision physics. In fact, if you look, you can see that the data agrees very well with the predictions at next to leading order using the CTEC 61 PDFs. And the fact that I was involved both in the CTEC 61 PDFs and this measurement has nothing to do with that. <laughs> so again, you know, good agreement. You see, uh, okay, the last bin is a little bit high, but that always happens, right? For the last bin, it's always a few. If it was low, there wouldn't be any events and you wouldn't show it. The yellow indicates the uh, systematic energy and the red indicates the PDF uncertainty. You can see there's a lot of PDF uncertainty at high PT for this measurement. And so that's something, well, we'd like to constrain that better because we'd like to look for new physics at high PT. And if there's so much uncertainty, both from the experimental level, from the theoretical level, then that makes life a little bit more difficult. So here's a similar result from the KT algorithm. And again, sort of similar type of systematics. And the agreement with the theory basically is the same as the agreement up here. So that's great, right? You're doing two analyses, you know, in completely independent, one using the cone algorithm, one using the KT algorithm. And you're getting similar agreement with the theory. That adds a robustness to your result that you wouldn't have if you were doing it with one algorithm by itself. Now, unfortunately, at the Tevatron, nobody's doing KT analyses. There's only this one analysis for the inclusive jet cross-section in CDF, and I'm not sure if there are any in D0. So the question is, why not? You know, why not, right? There's, you know, thousands of graduate students in CDF and D0, and they're all looking for, you know, some sort of topic to prove that something doesn't exist. You know, well, why not at the same time use a different algorithm so that you've contributed to the field as well? Because at the LHC, we really <coughs> want to have these two tools in place. We'd like to do as many analyses as possible with both the uh, KT and the cone algorithm. So here are the uh, more run two results, and Nigel showed these. These are just different rapidity regions. And again, you can see there's fairly good agreement you know, with the CTEC 6-1 predictions at next to leading order. One of the things that's very interesting, let's look at this rapidity uh, range here from 1.6 to 2.1. One of the things that's interesting there is that the PDF uncertainty is a lot larger than the experimental uncertainty. And if I look at the experimental cross-section, if anything, it's a little bit below the CTEC 6-1 prediction. So this means that, ah, this data might have additional constraining power on the PDF uncertainty for the next round of PDF fits. And for example, eigenvector 15, which is responsible basically for the plus and minus excursions and all of these rapidity ranges here, you know, we might have to say goodbye to it because it may end up being inconsistent with this new data. And again, Mandy is going to talk about uh, PDF uncertainties and eigenvectors, et cetera, in her talk. And again, Nigel showed this as well. So these are the KT results. And actually, you know, uh, Robert Thorne from UCL told me that the calm results had never been presented. And that's because, you know, this looks so similar to the cone results that he thought that they were the same thing. So again, you know, it's good to have these two types of uh, jet algorithms used to give a robustness to the analysis. Now, one of the problems with the KT algorithm has been with the speed. You know, because you're looking, checking all these different combinations for towers or particles, that the, the amount of time that it took went as the order of n cubed. But Kachari and Salam have come up with an algorithm that basically recognizes something obvious. The things that are close together in momentum space are also going to tend to be close together 
in coordinate space. So you can restrict the range that you're checking over, and then you find out that it doesn't increase very much as, far as a function of the number of incident particles. In fact, it's already been implemented in Atlas, and it would be interesting for it to be implemented in you know, CDF and V0 as well. Okay, so what's the problem? Everything that I've said so far is, you know, the count algorithm agrees with the KT algorithm, you know, the experimentalists are happy. You know, what's the problem? Well, the theorists aren't happy, or at least some of the theorists aren't happy. And the problem is that we're trying to, you know, compare the results in a calorimeter that are the results of a parton shower, hydronization, detector effects, to two partons in a next to leading order calculation. Because that's what we have in next to leading order, as, as uh, Nigel said. Two partons. And those two partons, we're trying to mimic all of the effects that are present in our jet reconstruction algorithm. So one of the problems we can run into, I can uh, show here. Suppose that I have two partons. So here's one parton. Here's a second parton that's a delta r of 0.9 away. And it has 60% of the energy. I construct a potential function in the form shown here. Then I end up with a potential that looks like this. And basically, every place in the minimum here, every place I have a minimum, if I try to put a jet algorithm, a jet cone, I would find a stable position. So this jet cone here contains only the parton on the left. This jet cone here contains only the parton on the right. And this right here, the midpoint between the two, contains both partons. So that was a great thing about the midpoint algorithm, because I come up with this solution that contains both of the partons. But the trouble is we don't measure partons. You know, we, what we have is much more messy. Suppose that I take you know, this potential function, but now I smear these partons so they have a spatial distribution. They're not just a Fermi across, but they you know, have something closer to the data. Well, if I give it a little bit of smearing, what I find is the central solution is lost. So if I try to put a jet cone here, it slides down to the left. So I've lost the central solution. If I put a little bit more smearing in, then I've lost the solution on the right. So that means that if I try to put a jet cone here, I end up here. What that means is that the towers of energy corresponding to this part on the right don't make it into any jet. Because if I try to put a jet cone there, it's an unstable position, and it just slides towards the larger energy deposition. And we end up with you know, what I've called dark towers. So here's a Monte Carlo event, and the towers labeled black are not part of any jet, even though they appear that they should be, because they're hard, and they're close to other hard scatters. But if I try to put a jet cone at this position here, it sees the larger green energy, and it's attracted away. So that was disturbing. You know, at least to me, it was disturbing. So for example, if I look at uh, Pythia diejet events at 400 GeV, 2% of the events have, of 400 GeV diejets have more than 50 GeV of unclustered energy. So that's a lot of unclustered energy. Now there's a solution. The solution is that whenever you have your jet cone, start off with a smaller cone. Some people call it a search cone, half the size. Use that to establish the stable jet positions. And then only when you've established those stable positions, expand it to its full size. So that way you're not swayed so much by having energy out on the periphery. But if you do that, you end up with a red curve. So you have basically no unclustered energy, but you have an infrared sensitivity, not unsafeness, but sensitivity of the order of 1%. So less unclustered energy, that's good. More infrared sensitivity, that's bad. <coughs> So that's the current state that we're in right now at the Tevatron. You know, we have algorithms, either the original midpoint algorithm as used by D0, or this modified algorithm as used by CDF. They both have good and bad points to them. And uh, again, since we're in Greece, you know, if I try to make a classical allegory, you know, it's like sailing between Scylla and Charybdis. And you know that somebody is going to die, you know, no matter which direction that you go. What we like to do is just kind of avoid you know, this passage altogether, just sail around the island. And that's, you know, for example, something we're going to have further discussion this summer at CERN, as part of the CERN Monte Carlo workshop. In any case, if I look at predictions for the LHC, 
I can see that instead of going out to 600 GeV, we're going out to multi-TeV, you know, the order of 4 TeV, say. And again, if I look at the uncertainties, you know, I see these green curves here, I can see that the uncertainties at the LHC are just as large or larger than the uncertainties at the Tevatron, you know, if I go out to the maximum BT. And again, it's all because of eigenvector 15 providing all the outliers. So again, if I can get rid of eigenvector 15, then I can see the uncertainty is going to be a lot smaller. So again, that's something that we'll have to see the results of the future uh, PDF analyses. So Nigel already talked about K factors. That's the next the leading order of the leading order prediction. And here, just for comparison, here's the K factor for the central cross section. You can see most of the time it's near one. But as I get out to the edge of phase space, it starts, you know, blowing up. Interestingly, if I look at the rapidity range from one to two or two to three, most of the time it's spent less than one. That doesn't mean that the predictions aren't valid at next to leading order. It just means that the next to leading order corrections are negative. And actually, if I can again advertise my paper, there's a very nice explanation of why that's so in the paper. So here's just what kind of reach we would have for 100, 10, 100 inverse femtobarns. And one of the things we'd like to look at, for example, is compositeness. <coughs> you know, is there something structured inside the core that's going to lead to new interactions that are going to lead to an increase in the jet cross-section? All right, here's something unexpected. Unexpected by me. And so, whenever we're doing corrections, right, we're doing QCD corrections, and we're doing them because alpha sub s is large compared to, you know, the alpha weak. But on the other hand, we know that there are these electroweak corrections, and they have a size of alpha weak log squared of ET squared over MZ squared. And at the Tevatron, this log never gets too large, but at the LHC, you know, that log can get pretty large because we're going out to 3 TeV, 4 TeV. And what they found, for example, is that there's a 25% reduction in the cross-section at the LHC, at high PT, just in this region where you might be looking for compositeness. Because of standard model effects, but standard model effects that at least I had never thought about you know, before this paper came out. So again, if we use the language of Donald Rumsfeld, this used to be an unknown unknown. Now it's a known unknown. So lots of progress, but you know, again, we don't know what else is out there. <laughs> All right, so briefly I'll discuss a, a few signatures. You know, again, some of the other speakers have also uh, discussed these. So for a photon and electron, here's a photon plus jet event. You can see the photon is very narrow. Basically all the energy is in one electromagnetic calorimeter tower. Contrast that to a jet which is spread out over many towers on the other side. And usually, whenever you uh, are looking at a photon, you're applying an isolation cut. Try to make sure you know, that uh, this is really a photon and not a jet that's put most of its energy into one particle. So sometimes you get lucky and you find lots of these guys in one of them. And so for example, we found this in CDF and run one. So it's an event that has two photons, an electron and a positron, and a large amount of <coughs> transverse energy. So that's like, you know, playing the slot machine and they all come up, you know, with the, the jackpot. And so this has caused lots of excitement. You know, lots of papers to be posted in Los Alamos. And people saying, yes, this is exactly the kind of signature that I've been predicting for years now. And so the question is, what is it? You know, is it new physics? Well, it's actually consistent with being a WW gamma gamma. So you say, well, maybe it is a WW gamma gamma. But the cross section is so small. But where things happen. And the only thing you can do is to sit back and wait for the next event to come along. But the trouble is it hasn't, right? And we have over 10 times the amount of data. So maybe it was just a fluke, and maybe it was a WW gamma gamma event, or maybe it was some new physics, but we're not probably going to see any concrete signs or further evidence of it until we get to the LHC. So if I have Z production, Again, very clean signature that can have a decaling into E plus E minus, mu plus E minus, or even tau plus tau minus. You know, background is very much under control, so it's a very clean signal. That's one of the reasons why it's very good for calibration. W production has a little bit more background. 
you know, you have a high PT lepton, which you're measuring in the detector, but on the other side, you have a neutrino, so you're looking for a missing ET signature. And again, the background's under reasonable control, but you have to do some things to try to control them. And again, there's a lot of the kinematics that's not known because you know, of this neutrino. And you have to try to understand the hydronic recoil if you want to do some subtle analyses such as the W mass. So let's look at W and Z physics of the Tevatron. So as I said, uh, they serve as a precision physics monitors. So for example, some people have proposed that all cross-sections at the LHC should be normalized to the W and the Z cross-section because experimental errors are small, theoretical errors are small. We know that W and Z cross-sections to the next to the next to the leading order. Here, for example, at the Tevatron, I show the data from CDF and D0. Also show predictions at leading order, next to leading order, next to next to leading order. And you can see that there's a big jump in going from leading order to next to leading order, but only a small jump in going from next to leading order to next to next to leading order. That's the kind of thing you like to see, because it shows you that the perturbative series is converging nicely. And the data, you know, still have some, you know, error bars, because we don't know exactly what the luminosity is, but they're very consistent with the next to next to leading order predictions. I've also shown the CTEC 6-1 predictions. So the central prediction is here, and this is the PDF uncertainty. And you might be gladdened by the fact that the two predictions from MRST at next to the leading order and from CTEC 6-1 the next to the leading order agree within the PDF uncertainties. But on the other hand, you might be alarmed because these are two central predictions, and they differ by the systematic uncertainty for PDFs. You would think they would be closer than that. That just goes to show how tricky this business of PDF uncertainties can be. And again, Mandy will be discussing this in more detail. So we've already seen the rapidity distributions, that leading order, next to leading order, next to next to leading order. PT distributions are very interesting. Here's the PT distribution for the Z. It nicely agrees with both resummation calculations and with Monte Carlo. So somebody at CDF, Uki Yang, had a very good idea of trying to estimate the uncertainty for initial state radiation on the top mass determination. So I have a TT bar event at the Tevatron. QQ bar comes in, produces a TT bar pair. You know, one the top's decaying to WB. One of the Ws decays semi-leptonically, the other hydronically. So you end up with a lepton plus four jets in the final state. But I could have initial state radiation, as we've seen from the discussion of the pseudocal form factors. And one of those gluons can be bigger in PT than one of the decay jets. So I have a misassignment, and that can change the value of the top mass that I reconstruct. Now, in run one, we had a very crude way of doing this. We turned the initial state radiation off. And we compared our result with initial state radiation off to that with it on. But that gave a fairly big error, like a GEV. That was obviously over an est estimate. And what Unki did was it said, OK, I'm going to measure Drillian pairs all the way down from the threshold up past the Z. And I'm going to measure the average PT of these pairs. I get this curve that's shown here. But I'm going to come up with two tunes for Pythia, one that goes above and one that goes below. And I'm going to use those as an estimate of the ISR uncertainty in the top mass. So here, for example, I have a curve with more initial state radiation. That's the PT of the TT bar pair. And here's with less. And by running that through the detector simulation, then you can end the top mass analysis. You can come up with an error for initial state radiation on the top mass analysis that's only a few hundred MeV and not the GeV that we had before. All right, WZ at the LHC. So again, it was something that's going to be a very you know, profound benchmark. So here I have the uh, cross-sections at leading order, next to leading order, next to next to leading order. Here I have the, uh, uh, the predictions from uh, CTEC. And I can see that now the two predictions from CTEC and MRST agree very well with each other. And if I look, again, the next to next to leading order correction to the next to leading order cross-section is small, but this time it's small and negative. If I look at the uh, CTEC uh, 40 error PDFs, 
I can see that the Z cross section is very tightly correlated with the W cross section. So if I have these error PDFs probing the different directions, that if I increase the C quark momentum that produces Ws, I'm also increasing the C quark momentum that produces Zs. So I have this very tight correlation between the two. I can also look at other things, for example, like TT bar cross section versus the W cross section. First at the Tevatron, and I can see there's just not so much structure here, but here I can see that there are two PDFs, two of the error PDFs, that lead to the largest cross section and the smallest cross section. And those turn out to be caused by eigenvector 15, which affects the high X gluon, because not very much of the top cross section of the Tevatron is some blue, blue initial state, but enough is that if I change it as much as eigenvector 15 does, then I lead to a noticeable change in the top cross section. If I look at the LHC, then I actually see an anti-correlation. So if I increase, for example, the top cross section, I decrease the bottom, the W cross section. So the top cross section is primarily blue-blue initial state. So if I give more momentum in the X range that produces a TT bar pair, I end up taking it away from the C quarks at lower X that produce the W, and vice versa. So these are the kind of correlations that one has to be careful about. I think I skip over that. So let me talk a little bit about the, the Higgs. So he, again, here we have the Z at the LHC, and it looks very much like the Z at the Tevatron. It peaks of the order of a few GeV. But now if I look at the Higgs production at a mass that's not too different, I see that it peaks at 13 or 14 GeV. So I've gone from 3 GeV to 13 or 14. So that should be a surprise to people. Right? Why so different? The reason is that it's a blue-blue initial state. So again, you have a larger color factor of the blue one compared to the quark. And also the fact that splitting function is different. You have the Z goes to zero pole. So it means that when you have a blue splitting off another blue, sometimes whenever you're on the influence of the Z goes to zero pole, you end up with a big transition and a big KT kick that ends up giving the final state for the Higgs a big KT kick as well. All right, so W plus jets at the Tevatron. So these serve as interesting for tests of perturbative QCD formalism, such as matrix elements, Martin showers, or both. It's both background and signal channel for a TT bar new physics. And again, signatures are just the signatures you have with a lepton, isolated lepton, missing ET, and jets in the final state. So if we look at the Tevatron, we observe up to seven jets in the final state. And one of the things that's interesting to note is that with this inclusive measurement, where all of the jets have the same PT cut, each additional jet means an additional factor of alpha sub s. So here's a situation where alpha sub s counting really is sufficient. Here are some of the results from the Tevatron corrected to the Hadron level. And again, the Hadron level means that it's corrected for all of the detector effects. So anybody who has a Monte Carlo model and wants to compare to the data can. So that's something that I think is an absolute essential for both the Tevatron and the LHC. Whenever you're doing an analysis, you need to correct the data back to the Hadron level or Parton level if you want. Typically what's been done at the Tevatron is that you take a Monte Carlo like Pythia, you run it through the detector simulation, then you compare that level you know, of prediction to what you measured in your calorimeter. Then you can say yes it agrees, yes it doesn't agree, but you can't do anything with it from that point on. You know, no outsider, no theorist can run his prediction and compare to your data because he doesn't have access to your detector simulation. But if you've corrected to the Hadron level, then he has all the tools that he needs in order to do that comparison. Okay, so Peter's talked about the CKKW scheme. Again, because of lack of time, I think I'll skip that. So you know what the CKQW scheme is. It's this nice way of combining matrix elements and parton showers. So here's another view of the W plus N jet uh, uh, measurements of the Tevatron. Again, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, etc. 
And here are the uh, CKKW predictions. And so you can see for zero jet in, that's produced mostly by W production by itself. If I have the one jet bin, then that's mostly one parton, some zero parton, and so on. All right, so we have a few minutes left. Let me give a pop quiz. Take out your pencil and paper. No, you don't have to write anything down. So, this is also from the paper. I'd like to ask the question, what's the difference between the diagrams of the top and the bottom? So take a moment to look at these diagrams for W production, plus a jet, blue on jet. So the possible answers are A, that the top describes initial state radiation, the bottom describes two goes to two processes. Two, there's no difference, they both represent the same physics. I had to have a third answer, right, so I was scratching my head. So C, what the hell was Carlo talking about? In <laughs> so the correct answer is B, although I'll get partial credit for C. That, <laughs> that basically, they are the same process, it's just a different way of writing it. Here I've written it in a particular way that makes you think initial state radiation. Here I've written it in a way that makes you think of two goes to two process. One of the myths, you know, that I know among my colleagues at least, is that if I have initial state radiation, it's going to be peaked in the forward direction. That most initial state radiation is in the forward direction. It's not. It's central. It can have a very wide range, depending on how soft the blue one is, but the most probable location is that y equals zero. So again, I would say that comes as a surprise to, to most people because I'm not used to thinking about it. You're used to thinking about, okay, the blue one comes off collinear. So the initial parton is going down the beam pipe. If it's coming off collinear, it's going to be in the forward region. Well, yes, that happens most of the time. But you're not interested in all blue ones. You're interested in blue ones about a certain transverse momentum. The most efficient place of producing that is at y equals zero. <coughs> All right. So here is a, we gave this title in the previous version of this talk. We used to say, listen to the logs, but thou shalt listen to the logs. Just because uh, Valerie Cosé was giving a talk that he called the Ten Commandments of QCD, so I decided there should be an eleventh commandment. Remember what we were talking about, if I look at W plus one jet, two jets, three jets, they fall down by a factor of alpha sub s. So it's a place where you can do just pure power counting in alpha sub s, and it describes the decrease. But now let's look in more detail at the, the one jet bin. So here's the lead jet, and here's the PT of the lead jet. And you can see that in run, uh, in run two of the CDF, we can get out to you know, almost 300 GeV. And let's look at this last bin. So the lead jet in the W plus greater than or equal to one jet bin you know, has more than 200 GeV. What's the average number of jets in the event? So you would think, well, I add another jet, that's a factor of alpha sub s. If I add two jets, that's a factor of alpha sub s squared. But now we have a logarithm that we've introduced. And the logarithm is the ratio of the lead jet ET to the cut that I'm applying to all the jets in the event, which is say, typically 15 GeV. That's a large logarithm that multiplies alpha sub s and alpha sub s squared. So we end up looking and we find, well, the peak is actually two jets, and there are three and four jet events in the final state. In fact, if I require there to be only one jet in the final state, then there's going to be a large Sudikoff suppression, because I'm requiring no hard blue and radiation. And that's something that uh, these partons want to do. In fact, it's interesting, if I look at uh, W plus jets at the LHC, I find that the W plus three jet cross-section at the LHC, at high PT for the leading jet, is actually much larger than the W plus two jet cross-section. And again, that may seem very counterintuitive, unless you think of the Sudikov suppression. All right, so... One of the things that we've been holding every two years are some summer studies at Les Uches in France. There's one in 2007, if you're interested. It's a very good place for a graduate student. We especially like to encourage graduate students to come. We reserve a number of places for them. 
it's a great place to rub shoulders with famous physicists such as myself, you know, and uh, to have eat lousy French food and drink lousy French wine. But the view is great. So one of the things I started there is a, a sort of a benchmark web page for physics at the LHC, especially at the standard model. And so some of it's gone into the Lazarus proceedings. Some of it I'm expanding on in this review article that I've talked about. So here's the article that's shown here. And here's actually the website where you can pick up this article in an almost complete version. And as soon as the internet decides to speed up again, I'll put a copy of my talk there as well. And so here's the website for the benchmarks. And so there's lots of things that would be useful for the LHC, like the PDF luminosities and uncertainties, expected cross-sections for things like jets, photons, diphotons, drill-EM, et cetera. One of the things I'm very interested in talking about, but I think maybe if we have time during the recitation, is looking at PDF luminosities. I think that's very uh, interesting. Let me just end by talking about the uh, next study order calculations in the wish list that uh, a certain experimenter came up with about five years ago. So he said, this, these are the next leading order cross-sections that we need to have calculated for the next leading order. So if you're a theorist, right, all of these are pretty daunting to do. In fact, none of these have been done because that's beyond the state of the art. But on the other hand, there are some calculations that do need to be done that are practical. But the question is, there's a finite amount of manpower available so you have to choose wisely which of these calculations you know, can be done you know, in the next few years. So the list that we came up at Lesouche is shown here. So WW plus jet, Higgs plus two jets. This is actually complete now. You know, by the, from the time that we made the list to now, this calculation has been done. TT bar, BB bar, TT bar plus jets, WW, BB bar, vector boson, uh, die vector boson plus two jets, vector boson plus three jets, three vector bosons. And again, all the reasons that I've shown here why these calculations are needed. And again, this is something that the, the theorists that do this type of thing are going to concentrate on in the next few years for the LHC. All right, so let me end with a summary just by saying that now is the time to set up the standard model tools and the measurement program that we need for the first few years of the LHC. There's a theoretical program that's going on at the same time to develop a broad range of tools for the LHC, and it's up to us experimentalists to make use of these <coughs> tools you know, that we've asked for, and also to drive the development of anything additional that we need. So the standard model benchmark website is shown here again. And as I said, the review paper is available in almost final form. And you can see that uh, one of the authors has already been honored in advance for his role in the paper. John Campbell and I are looking forward to our meeting as well. So it's interesting, the last time that I showed this, you know, uh, summary transparency, you know, I heard someone from the audience saying, well, who's that in the picture? And that was my chance to say, oh, you mean the woman standing next to James Sterling? Well, that's the Queen of England. <laughs> so again, this is going to be very interesting times. You know, once the LHC turns on, things are going to move very quickly, right? Competitions between experiments, between groups. And I'm going to end with the, uh, another quote from uh, Donald Rumsfeld. It's actually a paraphrase of the quote of his, which is that we take data not with the detector we want, but with the detector we have. All right, I think I'll end there, and again, maybe recitation, we can talk about PDF numerosities.